All right, uh, I'll be talking about the Kerr solution um, to the Einstein field equations. Uh, feel free, of course, to um, bug me with any questions um, that you have along the way. As this is a um, kind of directly analogous to the, the Schwarzschild solution, um, just with, with one additional um, important parameter, uh, I, I wanted to take a, a more, um, a, a less mathematically rigorous approach um, and, and do some of the, the good um, uh, interpretation of, of the, um, the project. So <clears throat> Schwarzschild solution, just a quick review. I'm using the, the minus plus 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 signature. Has a g mu nu that is given as, as we've seen in class um, with the, the, the usual uh, diagonal GTT, GRR, G theta theta, and G phi phi components. Um, and the Schwarzschild radius, of course, is given as um, 2gm for m being the mass of the black hole. And I'm using c equals 1 units throughout this. This was found in 1916, uh, which was very early on um, and uh, really quite remarkable how, how simple it is um, in comparison to the next analytical model which was found, which was the, um, and is the Kerr solution. Um, the Kerr solution requires a new coordinate system um, where you have um, an additional parameter alpha called the Kerr parameter. And that alpha um, uh, is equal, you can see here at the bottom, it's equal to the ratio of the angular momentum of the uh, black hole to its mass. You, you would think <clears throat> perhaps it can actually uh, obtain any value. It is actually a limited parameter bounded between 0 and 1, um, as we'll see in just a second. But what you can also see is um, it, uh, it reduces nicely just to the, the Schwarzschild solution if you set that parameter alpha to 0. Um, one of the things that, um, that I forgot to mention from the first slide, you probably saw it, uh, there's um, a, a, a symmetry. Let me actually just go back. <coughs> a symmetry um, in, this, in this spherical case with no rotation. Um, and Birkhoff's theorem says that the external solution, um, in other words, outside of the short child radius, um, that the, um, the solution must be given by the Schwarzschild metric in the vacuum. Uh, however, in this case, where you do have uh, rotation of the black hole, um, you break that spherical symmetry, and you no longer have um, has the Schwarzschild solution being appropriate, um, at least in the, <coughs> uh, the, the fast rotator sense. Uh, the Kerr solution, the metric is um, given here. Um, you'll notice that this is just one form. There are many forms. Um, the boyer lindquist um, coordinates are very useful, but they were actually not the first ones that were developed. Uh, these were, um, this, this solution was developed a little later on, and the reason why it is preferred um, when dealing with this most of the time is because it only has <coughs> an off-diagonal element there and there whereas other coordinate systems tend to be uh, much more difficult to deal with. Um, and the, the line element is, is messy, to say the least. Uh, the, the, the delta and the sigma are given here are just for convenience. And I've included this um, just because it is a, a natural extension, if you would like to, um, where instead of considering not only just the rotation of the black hole, but also its charge, black holes can have charge, angular momentum, and mass. And the charge there can be included for Q, the, the total net charge of the black hole, which usually is assumed to be 0, but it does not have to be. <clears throat> for, this, for this, we're going to, to set this equal to 0. If you did not want to set it equal to 0, then it just expands into, instead of just the Kerr solution, but the Kerr Newman, uh, Newman solution. And uh, changes things a little bit, but isn't, um, isn't that far off from, from the, the method pre uh, presented here. If you would like, by the way, to, to go through this method on your, on your own, I highly recommend Hartle's book, um, The Gravity and Introduction to Einstein's General Relativity. Uh, very good for being able to get um, especially a qualitative feel as to what's going on. Um, and then there's also an archive um, uh, paper if you would like to go over more of the, the heavy math and especially the coordinate 
transformations. It's a very good paper, um, and you will regret probably reading it if you're doing it for fun. So <coughs> uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics which is um, apparent not only in Schwarzschild but in this one is that it must be asymptotically flat. So in other words, in the limit of r being much greater than gm um, and the curve parameter together, um, then the line element ds here, um, if you just take the leading term of each of these, um, each of these um, components, you will get um, it reducing to the, the flat metric, which is what you would assume. There are two additional things which weren't talked about in class, um, but you might have heard of them before. Killing vectors, they're called, after <coughs> a guy whose last name was Killing. And uh, they, are, um, they are vector fields in which the metric is preserved. Um, so if, you know, if, you were to, if you were to translate it along one, one way, the metric would be unchanged. Um, there's a little explanation down if you'd like to read it. But the, uh, the killing vectors are associated with a, a time component and um, uh, an angular uh, rotation component, the phi component. And they have conserved quantities that go along with them. For the, the u here being the four velocity, you have <coughs> a conserved energy, E, and angular momentum, L, per unit mass. We'll get back to, to that in just a second. Uh, if you look back, uh, let me scroll back here. If you look at the, uh, these terms, the metric, you've got a 1 over delta, and you've got a 1 over sigma. Um, and those are possibilities for singularity, see the coordinate or curvature singularities in the, <coughs> in the metric. You can see that from the, um, from the sigma equation, you get a singularity if r is equal to 0 and theta equals pi over 2. In other words, if you're in the, the plane of, of rotation, the, the um, equatorial plane. Um, and then for uh, the delta equation, <coughs> you get um, a plus or minus um, term, uh, an, an inner and an outer horizon, they, they will be called, uh, where you have the short child solution and, of course, the, the rotation parameter alpha um, that are included. Uh, going, going over this just briefly, um, I didn't want to bring in many of the, the different coordinate systems because there are quite a few, but one of the coordinate systems called Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates uh, makes a transformation similar to that which was done with the Schwarzschild solution where you were able to, um, to reduce uh, <coughs> at least one of the sets of, um, of singularities into um, just a coordinate singularity. In other words, you're able to remove it by this transformation. Uh, this isn't able to be shown for the r equals 0 and the theta equals pi over 2. Um, and we'll get to that just here in the next slide. The singularity at r equals 0 <coughs> in the equatorial plane uh, is, is more complicated. And um, choosing the, the coordinate system that you want to work in uh, is important. Some of them, like Cartesian coordinates for the Kerr solution, are very difficult and computers don't like them very much. So um, this is uh, from a, a Mathematica notebook um, that the professor um, gave. And here you're able to solve for um, the quadratic curvature invariant, the Riemann squared term. Um, and uh, the, the Ricci scalar and Ricci tensor are uh, 0 throughout when you solve them. But the, the quadratic curvature invariant um, is not. And it, um, if it has a curvature um, singularity, then it will be, um, it will diverge, it will, it will go to infinity um, at, at that singularity. And because it's an invariant, that means that regardless of the coordinate system that you're using, that it will be um, a, a curvature singularity at, in any coordinate system that you use. So you can see here this bottom term right here. This is all multiplied, it's a really long equation. But this bottom term here goes to zero for the, the terms of r um, being 0 and theta as pi over 2, um, as expected. So it is a, a curvature singularity, a, a real singularity, just like in the, the Schwarzschild solution of r equals 0. Um, the r plus or minus, if you go back, you will notice that as alpha goes to 0, this just um, becomes r plus or minus equals the Schwarzschild radius. So 
uh, it reduces to um, just the, the horizon for the short shell metric. The singularity at R, um, <coughs> R plus, uh, I won't be talking about the R minus uh, surface and inner horizon. Um, it isn't really treated in the Hartle book, and, and there's other things to talk about. But the R plus. So R minus goes to R equals zero, right? Hmm? R minus goes to R equals zero in the short shell limit. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's where Riemann squared is actually singular, isn't it? Still. Hmm? Maybe. Probably, you're probably very correct. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look at that. Yeah. Um, so going through uh, this, we're going to be bringing up one additional thing, a null vector. Like the killing vector didn't discuss it in class. Um, but a null vector um, is just, um, uh, or a null surface is a three surface. In other words, removing one of the coordinates such that you have a zero line element everywhere. In other words, your ds squared is equal to zero. Um, in doing this, you have a, you know, just a dot product of, of three different um, um, spatial component or space and time components. And when you do the dot product, you have to bring in the metric component here. And this is just some arbitrary vector which we haven't solved for yet. Um, and we're going to, by setting equal to zero, assume that there is a null surface um, at R, uh, R plus at the, um, the, the horizon. Uh, this when we reduce it, allows us to get the following equation below. And solving it, we can see that, um, that the L theta term must be equal to 0. And of course, the, you can see the first 0 here is the LR. We're assuming a constant radius, so that, um, that doesn't come into the null, uh, null surface at all. But then we get this um, uh, a 1 for the, the LT term and uh, a term for L phi, which indicates the rotation of, of the black hole. In other words, not, not the best way to probably think about it is if you were to have uh, photons at that surface, they would rotate um, with that angular velocity. All right. There are limitations on the curve parameter, specifically um, that it must be greater than 0. You can choose a coordinate system um, such that it is always non-negative um, just by you know, choosing it to go one direction. It doesn't actually matter in this case because you square it. Um, but what you do get is that, um, that alpha must be greater than 0 but less than or equal to 1. Uh, when it gets too close to 1, it, they're called um, extreme, uh, extreme uh, rotators or extreme uh, curved black holes. And theoretical limits say that it probably gets to about 0.998. Uh, gm squared for the, the rotational, um, the, the, the angular momentum of, of the black hole. In the equi uh, equatorial plane, yeah? So where, where does this 0.998 come from? Uh, they quote it in Hartle um, models of, of accretion disks say that it shouldn't get much more than that. They don't explain it necessarily. So this is theory though, not observation. <sighs> Fair question. They do have some observation to back it up, but I think he was saying specifically theory at that point. Um, but I, I don't know the, I haven't looked up the sources. Uh, yes? Doesn't it have to be theoretical if it's right around the, the center? I mean, have we ever measured anything that's going on there? I think so. Well, I was asking about the specific value of 0.988 or whatever it was. Why that? Why that? Do with like stability of the accretion disk. It's, uh, so it's not a relativity limit, it's more like um, mechanical limit. Okay. Um, using, again, the, uh, the conserved quantities E and L from before the, the energy per mass and angular momentum per mass. And this L is different from the angular momentum J of the black hole, just to not be confused. And L, sadly, just as is typical, L is also used for um, the null surface. Um, L, so don't don't get confused by that. Um, but when we when we write out, you know, E equals um, the uh, the psi um, times the the four vector four velocity u, u you get um, the metric included here. And when you solve this, 
you know, noticing that this is just d phi d tau, um, you're able to solve this for two equations, one in t and one in phi. The, the additional things, as you are in the equatorial plane, you can say that there's no four velocity component in the theta direction, and that um, with c equals one, that your um, uh, four velocity squared is going to be equal to minus one. With these, all these constraints together, you're able to determine what the, the r component is, um, how r changes with proper time. Uh, <clears throat> this here, of course, is just related to the energy of the, um, the object that's about the black hole. Oftentimes, we just treat that being equal to zero. In other words, it has zero kinetic energy at, um, at uh, infinite r. And in that case, e would just be equal to one, which is how we did it in class for the short child. Um, so when we work through the, we get an effective potential as such, which is slightly more complicated, but not too much than the short child one. Um, at which is given below. Uh, it is a little more difficult to, to be able to interpret this. Um, and so you have to um, hold constant sum or solve for all of the parameters all at once. It's a bit of a pain. Um, and just kind of a reference, um, you know, there, there is a, a limit to, to uh, the angular momentum of a particle and, and, and whether or not it'll be able to fall into the black hole. Uh, continuing the orbits, uh, the effective potential is plotted in the, the vertical axis. And here we have um, <clears throat> you know, E equals 1, so we're, we're assuming zero kinetic energy at infinity. And we are um, looking at various uh, values of L and alpha. Um, right here, oh, sorry, this is a constant L and constant alpha. And then we are letting alpha and L vary um, oppositely. Uh, we see that you will have a, a peak for some of them, and some of them will not have any peak, indicating that um, that a particle from infinity will fall into the horizon, into the singularity. Um, but some of them will will come in, bounce back, and uh, and have a, an orbit. There is a limit to to what orbit you are able to have. Uh, there are <coughs> uh, there are three equations that you can solve, uh, specifically the um, the effective potential equation, and then the derivative of that, which for a circular orbit will be zero. And then if you want um, a stable orbit, then that means that the second derivative of the effective potential has to be zero as well. Um, in otherwise, a small perturbation would cause it to, to fall in, um, in or away from the, the singularity. So solving all these um, at the same time, you get um, a set of of, of points. Uh, this is, of course, the, um, uh, the innermost stable circular orbit um, versus the, the alpha parameter of the black hole. And you see that you know, right here, this would be the Schwarzschild um, radius. You're able to get for a, a co-rotating, in other words, so the black hole is rotating in the same direction as the particle um, about it, you're able to get um, at about half of the Schwarzschild radius to it, whereas if you rotate in the opposite direction, you will actually not be able to get as, as close. Uh, this is a, an evidence of frame dragging, and there are actually some really cool pictures where you have you know, a counter-rotating object coming in and all of a sudden reversing its direction and falling into the singularity, just due to, to the effect of frame dragging in the, in the, in the close limit. So the dots are just uh, what you used uh, to plot that curve. Those are your dots, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I just had to solve the equation. I didn't want to. Because it's a cubic or something. Yeah, it's, it's a nasty equation you have to do numerically, so. Um, lastly, I um, wanted to talk about the ergosphere. Uh, if, for the Schwarzschild solution, you're able to, um, if you had enough propulsion, to remain stationary at any point um, above the, the event horizon. However, uh, that is not the case with the Kerr solution, particularly if you try to have uh, a, a constant spatial component of your four velocity, um, then taking the magnitude of that, you're able to, um, to get a limit as to how close you can get. In other words, this term right here um, can't be zero. When you solve that, you're able to find what's called um, uh, the ergosphere radius, um, which is related to alpha and, of course, theta. And that this shows that there's a limit to how close you can get 
uh, without having any type of motion. So any closer than that and you will fall into the, the event horizon. Um, it is possible, and I, I didn't want to bring it up, it is possible to rotate with a black hole and get closer than that uh, within the ergosphere. Just a, a brief thing um, tor towards here the end. Uh, this is a, just a slice um, of the uh, event horizon R plus here and the ergosphere for um, an extreme black hole just to emphasize the difference between them. So you're able to see that, uh, that you're able, you know, not, not, not even to be, um, what would that be? That would be a short child radius, yeah. So within a short child radius um, in the equator, you're not able to get any closer without um, falling in or having to rotate. There are a lot of other interesting things. Highly recommend you look it up. Um, uh, the Penrose process, where you're able to get energy out of uh, the Kerr solution black hole, um, but don't have time for that right now. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Uh, how do you interpret this event horizon here? Hmm? How do you interpret this event horizon here? Um, I mean, the event horizon would be uh, a point at which if you were within, you would have, was it space-like separation outside? You, you couldn't, the, the forward light cone would, would go towards the, the origin there. Oh, I see. Um, it, it's just like the, um, uh, the Schwarzschild. Okay, but things can still escape from that, right? Uh, from, from the outer one, the ergosphere? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah but, but the, the, the event horizon R plus, no. Okay, okay. The Penrose process is where you shoot in a, a particle that decays, one half goes into the event horizon R plus and one half leaves with more energy than it started with. So yeah. all right. More questions. Um, yeah. There is a coding in which pure solution only have uh, curvatures in that so What? Uh, there is a uh, coordinate in which there's a coordinate system in which the Kerr solution yeah. only has a... Yeah, 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 the, the Eddington-Finkelstein. Yeah. I didn't want to put in the, the full metric for it or anything, but... Okay. Right. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I'll be talking about gravitational lensing today. Okay, so you all probably already know this, but um, just in a nutshell, gravitational lensing um, is when you've got two objects along your line of sight that are, um, and the lens object is in the middle. So it has to be pretty massive to actually um, curve space time enough for you to observe the lensing effect. So usually we talk about lensing by galaxies. Um, so you have some object that's behind your lens object, um, the light paths get bent, and then what we see is, is this um, asymptote here. So when we trace that back, we see a false image off to the side, and we can see multiple false images. Um, here's an actual um, picture of what a lens system looks like. Um, so I'm not going to go through this a whole lot because we derived this in class. Oh, great. OK, my PDF is missing some of the symbols. Um, but anyways, if you start with the sh um, short trial metric um, and the free fall equation, and then just assume regular GR so you don't um, have to put any of the brand sticky parameters. Um, so here's the short child metric, here's the free fall equation. Then you get um, the B of R and the metric is one minus two mg over R. Um, and A of R is approximately um, one plus two mg over R when you expand it. Um, so in this diagram, you can solve for the R equation um, and then um, make some substitutions so that you have it in terms of DRD phi instead of DRD tau and then integrate and that will give you the total deflection angle, um, which this should say it's 4 mg over um, EC squared plus higher order terms. And this is actually twice the Newtonian prediction. Okay, so remember that result. This is the, just the geometry of a um, simplified lens system that we're going to look at. So this is the observer, U, L is the lens, this um, S is the source. And then S1 is where you think the source is when you make your observation. 
Um, the assumptions that we make um, for the following slides are that um, these, di these projected distances along our line of sight are very large, so you can make small angle, approx small angle approximations. Um, and also, um, since these distances are so large, you can also make the thin lens approximation, which is that all of the, um, the deflection action occurs in the lens plane. So instead of having a curve like the previous slide, instead of having this curved path, you're just going to replace that with the two asymptotes. And because we're making the thin lens approximation, we can also um, generalize a 3D lens mass distribution to a 2D distribution that lies completely in the lens plane. Um, so this is just um, basic geometry, more math that an undergraduate can do. So just labels alpha tilde is the quote unquote true deflection angle um, from the first um, slide that I showed. Um, plane alpha is the observed or scaled deflection angle. That is um, the angle between the actual source position and where you observe this um, image S1. And the, the lens equation relates the position of your source with the relation to the lens to the deflection that you observe. So beta equals theta minus alpha is just from this diagram. And then you can just fill in um, also alpha is equal to um, the distance between the lens and the source over the distance of the source times alpha tilde. And that's just from the small angle approximation. Okay, so insert that into the um, lens equation. So now we have this. And you can solve for the special case where beta equals zero. So remember, beta is the angle between your um, source object and the lens. So if beta equals zero, that means that your source is directly behind the lens. Um, so you get this um, theta Einstein, the Einstein radius, they call it, is sort of the angular scale that's characteristic for these kinds of um, lensing events. Um, and of course, if it's directly behind the lens, then there's no preferred direction for the light to be um, bent into. So, so you should see just a perfect ring, and you call that an Einstein ring. Um, and these are just some nice examples of Einstein rings from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and also, uh, if you plug in numbers, um, the Einstein radius is about one arc second for galaxy scales, and that's something that we can um, observe, obviously. If you're looking at a smaller scale, like some star, a couple stars in our own galaxy, then this is not observable. But you can see some um, lensing effects. I'll get to that later. Um, so also, if you don't make the assumption that beta equals zero, you can um, introduce some scaled variables. So x is just um, a scaled version of theta, and y is a scaled version of beta. And your lens equation becomes something like y equals x minus 1 over x. Um, can solve that and you'll get two solutions for x. So um, what this means is that if you're generalizing to um, point sources, then when your source is offset from the lens, then you'll get two images, two image positions. And these are some, are some examples. So like here, here are two, um, two images, here's two images. Some of these you'll see multiple images um, and that's because if it's not you know, perfectly point sources, um, your lens galaxy can have some sort of weird shape and that will, also, that will give you multiple image points. Okay. So if you don't just have point sources, obviously lens galaxies are um, non-trivial two-dimensional mass distributions. So just replace um, you know, beta and alpha and theta with vectors. Um, and you can define a critical surface mass density um, sigma critical. And using that, you can write a dimensionless surface density that describes um, your lens. Um, we'll call that kappa. So if you want to find out what is your observed deflection angle given some lens distribution, um, just do the integral over kappa, this here. And you'll notice that this can be written, um, you can write alpha of theta as the gradient of some um, scalar potential, where the scalar psi is given by this expression here. Um, so 
you should notice that these equations look really similar to Newtonian um, equations for gravitation. So we have a source term, so kappa is sort of like our source term. We have some scalar potential, and we have some quantity that is the gradient of that scalar. Um, so in gravity, the thing that's the, gra the minus gradient of your, your scalar is the force. So um, you can think about it as if you have some gradient in your force, you get tidal distortions in your object. So you can take a sphere, and tidal forces will stretch that into an ellipsoid. And the same thing can happen with um, light being bent by a deflection potential. So um, a gradient in, your, um, in alpha, a gradient in your deflection angle, um, leads to a deformation of your light, of your source image, sorry. So that's what um, I've shown here. So if you start with some, a perfect circle and it gets um, deformed by a gradient in alpha, then it can turn into a rotated, stretched out ellipse. Um, and the way to go back and forth between these two images is the Jacobian matrix. Um, so you, um, A is d beta d theta, and this is what you get if you um, do out the math, where kappa is what we were talking about before. Um, and the kappa term will determine the magnification of the image you're seeing. Um, and the gamma 1 and gamma 2 are um, the parts of your complex shear. So if you write your complex shear like this, where um, it's equal to gamma 1 plus i gamma 2, then you can also rewrite it with some phase. Um, and this phase determines how rotated this ellipse becomes. Um, the eigenvalues of your Jacobian matrix will give you the major and minor axes. So basically, the gammas tell you how stretched out your ellipse becomes. Um, and the determinant gives you the magnification. Um, and one thing to note is that the surface brightness of your source image is preserved during this transformation. Um, but if you magnify it, then of course, you've got a bigger object with the same surface brightness. So the total flux that you receive from your image increases. So um, we're going to move on to some applications and different types of gravitational lensing. Um, the first one, and the one that most people think about when they talk about gravitational lensing, is strong lensing. Um, so all those pictures that I showed earlier are examples of strong lensing, where your source actually forms multiple images. And you'll get strong lensing if the determinant of your um, Jacobian equals 0. So remember before I said that magnification is 1 over your determinant, so yes. That does mean that you can get magnifications going to infinity formally. Um, but um, that's not that weird, right? Because when you're teaching, like, say, the 3C class here, you can also have your magnification for 1 over um, d image minus the focal length in a very simple lens system also go to infinity. Um, in practice, of course, you don't really see this because we made some assumptions here, and geometric optics will break down eventually. Um, so this is true if the surface density somewhere in your lens object exceeds the critical surface density uh, sigma. Um, and if you make the calculations for a typical strong lens, critical surface density is about one gram per centimeter cubed, oh, squared, because it's a surface density, um, which you can definitely achieve this critical density in galaxy clusters and galaxies. Um, so what can we do with strong lensing? Um, so with gravitational lensing, um, it's interesting because usually when you think about the use of a lens, you're studying the source object. Um, but the majority of the time, we're actually interested in using gravitational lensing to study the lens object. Um, so we can use it to measure the um, mass profile of our lens, basically. You can um, do some math going backwards. If you know what your image is, then what shape does the lens have to be to deform the image into that shape? Um, and one result from this is that if you're looking at um, the largest scales of dark matter substructures, so galaxy clusters, um, using gravitational strong lensing, people have found that um, we really don't know whether um, a navarro frank white profile or an isothermal profile is the best fit to the dark matter. So I guess that's not a result. That's like a non-result. Um, so this is one exception to that, where um, this is actually from the work of Jay Kalanog here, who's um, going to defend his thesis next week. 
Um, and he actually uses strong gravitational lensing to study the faint source object. Um, so in this case, he's interested in studying um, these faint star forming galaxies. Um, so these green contours are the actual sources. And then in, I think this is the interesting column. Um, the blue ellipse is the model that you can get for the source that produces these images. I was going to say, sometimes the, the lens you can't see, it, right? Sometimes the right. lens is some sort of black hole. Right. In that case, of course, the density would be very high, this uh, density grams per centimeter square that you have. Right? Mm -hmm. these are, in this case, though, the lens is visible, is it? Yeah, so these are galaxy, galaxy lens um, systems. So you can see this is the actual image, and then to go from here to here, he had to subtract out the lens object because he was more interested in the source. Um, another type of lensing is weak lensing, which is a more subtle effect. Um, so weak lensing is um, if you're a little farther away or if you don't meet um, the requirements for strong lensing, you can still see the effect um, because, like I said, the, um, the effect of gravitational lensing is to elongate your image and then rotate it so that it's um, more tan um, it's sort of tangent to your source. So this is a picture of, from Wikipedia of what you should see. So he, these are unlensed, just um, more round galaxies. And then if you add in a lens, they'll become stretched out and sort of aligned to form kind of circle shapes around um, your lens object. And this is an example of that in practice. So you, um, the most um, obvious examples are like here. You can see some, some stuff has been distorted along an arc and here. So with multiple sources in this case, right, with multiple lensing objects. Yeah, you need multiple objects to, um, to do weak lensing. Um, so really, they wouldn't just use these obvious objects. They would use the whole field and do some sort of statistical analysis to come up with a mass distribution for the lens. Um, yeah, so like I said, um, you can do the same kind of things that you do with strong lensing, study the mass distribution of your lens object. Um, this is a famous example of how weak lensing was used to measure a mass distribution. So the bullet cluster um, is sort of the, um, it's, it's the example everyone pulls up to say why dark, ma to support dark matter being um, a particle instead of mond. Um, so in this picture, the dark dots are the X-ray emission. So that's all the, the visible luminous matter in the form of gas. And these are two clusters that came together and impacted. So you can see that all the gas kind of stuck together in the middle. But if you use weak lensing to see where um, the bulk of the mass really is, it's actually offset from the visible, um, the visible matter. Um, so what people say is that these came together, the gas got stuck in the middle, but the dark matter, which was non-interacting, passed through each other. And that's why it came out, these came out on the other side. Um, another use for weak lensing is to measure um, the cosmic shear. Um, so if you just take a lot of weak lensing measurements all over the place. Um, we know there's dark matter substructure in the universe. If you, I guess if you believe in dark matter, um, you believe that there's dark matter substructure and that will lens all the galaxies and you can come do a big statistical analysis um, and determine the level of the fluctuations in, um, in density. Um, and then the last example of gravitational lensing is microlensing. Um, so for the larger scale types like weak lensing and strong lensing, um, the distances are sufficiently far enough that you're not going to notice any change in your image. Um, because even if these, the lens is passing in front of the source, it's happening on a very, very long, unobservable time scale. Um, microlensing deals with systems that are closer together. So the time scales are short enough that we will see some change in the image. Um, but because these systems are pretty close, you can't resolve the Einstein radius, or the Einstein radius is very small. So um, the thing that we actually observe is the change in magnification or the change in brightness of the image. So here's an example of a light curve. Um, so you've got some star passing, some object passing between you and a nearby star. Um, and then this, this axis is in days. So over the course of like 300, um, say 300 to about a year, um, this object spiked in brightness and then went back down after that um, lens passed through the line of sight. Um, like Craig mentioned, um, 
One notable application of microlensing was to rule out massive compact halo objects as the dark matter candidate. Um, so there was actually a big survey to look for microlensing events. And when they, they saw that there weren't enough of these events for the number of machos that you would need to explain away dark matter, um, machos were pretty much ruled out. Um, a really interesting way to use microlensing is to look for exoplanets. Um, so if you have a star with a planet going around it, if that star is the lens that passes between you and another star that's further away, then you'll get this, um, this overall big change in brightness. But if you also have a little planet accompanying that star, that is, it's sort of like a perturbation, and that planet produces this additional little spike in brightness. So there are big collaborations that will monitor microlensing events to look for exoplanets. And it's nice because it's especially sensitive to low mass planets, which a lot of other planet finding techniques are not. Oh. And I think that's the end of the slideshow. So any questions? Is the uh, wavelength affected by gravitational lensing? It looks like from the photo it looked more blue. Um, no, so it should be wavelength independent. Yeah, so one way um, I think that they found out the first like strongly lensed quasar, the way they knew it was gravitational lensing was that the two images had the same spectrum and the same brightness and the same color. We mostly talked about two-dimensional lenses. What about the three-dimensional case? Uh, have you seen anything that, that, that is done? I, mean, um, I would imagine it would be just, just as doable. It's mostly all two dimensional because um, you can use simple the, formulas and things. Yeah, and I mean the dis the the sizes of those objects are so small compared to the distances between them that it's it's good enough to use the projected mass distribution. I think the other errors are that you would get from these kinds of observations would be a lot bigger than the errors from that. Yeah. Okay. So hi, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, I'll be talking to you guys today about gravitational wave detection, uh, generation and detection. Um, before we get started, um, it's sort of a, trying to condense a lot of a broad field into a very short talk, so I'm going to probably breeze through a lot of stuff really quickly. Um, and uh, this is not my, my field of expertise, so feel free, free, feel free to chime in at any, uh, anything that I've overlooked or, uh, or misrepresented. Um, but anyway, let's get started. Here's a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, just talking about uh, direct detection versus indirect detection and different cosmological sources for uh, gravitational waves. Um, but before we get started with that, just a real quick uh, recap about uh, gravitational waves. Um, I find it useful to have kind of an intuitive definition of what these things actually are. Um, uh, I like to think of them as uh, tidal forces which propagate as waves. Um, and the speed at which they propagate is the speed of light. Um, and as we, as we showed in class, um, there are two non-trivial polarization states, uh, which we call the cross-polarization and x-polarization. -pol um, you can see that by rotating one 45 degrees, you get the other. Um, and as the professor pointed out in class, this is uh, consistent with the idea of the graviton being spin two. Uh, so here are just two, uh, two animations that show the two different polarizations. Uh, the points on those animations would represent test particles, the way that they would be affected by gravitational waves. Um, and then the, uh, the diagram in the middle um, just shows some uh, tidal force lines uh, as well. Um, so you can see that for both of these, what you essentially have is space uh, being squished in uh, one direction while being elongated in the other direction. And that's going to be the important characteristic uh, of these waves that we measure. Uh, and we're going to call it the amplitude of a gravitational wave, the basically the amount of stretching or the, the distance change between uh, two of those particles um, relative to the uh, initial displacement. And of course, these are extremely exaggerated. Uh, in reality, we're looking to detect things that are 
where that, um, that amplitude is on the order of 10 to the minus uh, 21 uh, or, or even lower. Okay. Um, and then just uh, real quick here, uh, gravitational waves are inherently a quadrupole phenomenon. Um, there's no such thing as monopole radiation. Uh, so spherically symmetric distributions, just shrinking and expanding won't give you waves. And uh, as far as we know, there's no such thing as negative mass. So uh, mass uh, um, dipoles aren't, aren't something that we need to consider. Um, so it's, it's apparent that, um, that quadrupole radiation is the lowest uh, uh, contribution. And then uh, just real quick, this basically uh, gives you the, lumino the luminosity from a uh, time-changing uh, quadrupole moment. Um, you can see it's related to the third time derivative. Um, and then the simplest, the simplest quadrupole, um, you can think of as a dumbbell, basically two masses um, <laughs> separated by a certain distance. And if those masses are rotating about one another, uh, you can have, you'll have a change in the quadrupole moment uh, and you'll have uh, gravitational radiation. Uh, so here's a, a diagram and uh, a couple equations um, basically for this uh, specific scenario, uh, talking about the luminosity, and then by uh, taking a sort of quasi-static um, point of view, you can, you can derive expressions for how the radius and the, uh, the angular frequency of the orbits change with time. Um, and this was just taken from my, uh, the textbook I used back at R RPI, who we didn't use Weinste uh, Weinberg because, uh, because Ohanian was uh, an emeritus professor there, so we used this book instead. Um, but anyway, so moving on, uh, just talk, to talk a little bit about uh, direct detection methods. Um, uh, so the early, uh, early attempts at making gravitational wave detectors, again, um, recapping what we talked about in class, um, gravitational waves are inherently a quadrupole phenomenon, so you would expect them to couple uh, to mass quadrupoles. So one, uh, one way of possibly detecting these things is to make a big-ish mass quadrupole, like a big a uh, big cylinder um, of metal, um, and then measure how, uh, how that cylinder absorbs uh, energy from gravitational waves. Um, uh, so these things can be, can be, rather, can be reasonably sensitive um, on the order of uh, the sensitivity of um, the first generation, I guess, yeah, first generation of uh, uh, ground-based laser interferometers, uh, but they're only effective over a very uh, narrow range of frequencies. You basically need to be uh, right on the uh, mechanical resonance frequency uh, of the detector in order to have any sort of measurable, uh, measurable effect. And this is just a picture of uh, this picture that shows up in every talk about this. So I figured I'd include it here of uh, Joe Weber working on one of the early uh, early bar detectors. Um, and then the other main main type of uh, uh, direct detector is. Uh, the interferometer. Um, basically, the the diagram here is it's just a big, uh, big Michelson interferometer. You have uh, you have two bars at uh, two arms at at right angles, and you try to measure a phase difference between light propagating in each of those arms. Um, um, you suspend uh, large mirrors at at each end. They act like the uh, free masses, so they behave like you would expect those those test masses in the in the you know if we go back. Um, so they essentially behave like these test masses here. Uh, so one end of the um, interferometer is going to shrink and the other is going to expand. Um, and that's going to generate a phase uh, difference that you, can, uh, that you can measure. Essentially, the, the travel time for the wave going down one arm of the interferometer will be lessened and the other will be uh, increased. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's analogous. Um, uh, since the, the wavelength of the gravitational radiation is much longer than the, the typical s characteristic size of these interferometers, um, it's, it's helpful to think of them as antennas, basically. They operate in the same, uh, the same regime, uh, which makes it useful to think about uh, you know, the antenna response of an interferometer. Uh, the, the, um, the sensitivity to um, measurements of different uh, polarizations is going to depend on where that gravitational ray is coming from. Uh, so here's just a couple of those plots. Um, here the, uh, the center of the inter interferometer is at the center of the diagram, and then the two black bars represent the arms. Um, and here this surface, the uh, distance from the, from the center is essentially the sensitivity uh, in that direction. Uh, and then for, for the two uh, 
uh, linear uh, polarization states and then for, uh, for unpolarized, just so you can get a sense of that. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, we can talk specifically um, the two uh, most competitive uh, experiments currently um, uh, characterized as ground-based interferometers are LIGO and Virgo. Uh, LIGO is a is a set of three uh, three interferometers, one of which is smaller than the other two. The two big ones both have four kilometer arm lengths. Um, um, uh, and even though the, the physical size of the arm is four kilometers, they, they, uh, um, they, have a, they basically create a, a, a resonance, uh, a, ca a cavity that allows multiple reflections back and forth. So the effective uh, arm length um, with respect to the detection uh, efficiency is, usual, is um, considered to be on the order of uh, hundreds of kilometers. Um, um, and then LIGO, uh, the, the first, um, I guess the, the initial uh, LIGO experiment, I'll talk a little bit about advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo uh, in a minute, um, but LIGO um, initially had the better peak sensitivity um, as opposed to Virgo, uh, which, is lo which is one detector located in Italy, slightly, lo slightly shorter arm length, um, not as good of a peak sensitivity, but they invested significantly in the uh, isolation um, mechanism for their mirrors. Uh, which gives them much better uh, damping against seismic activity. So they actually have a much better sensitivity uh, in the low frequency range, below uh, 40 hertz. Um, and to just characterize that, uh, what, what we're looking at here is basically a graph of uh, sensitivity as a function of uh, frequency uh, for the initial LIGO and Virgo detectors and the planned uh, advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo deployments. Uh, which are current, w at which both these are detectors are currently being retrofitted. Um, so you can see here the red curve is LIGO, and you can see that. Oh, so basically, um, what we're looking at here is a noise, noise spectrum. So essentially, at a given frequency, your signal would have to be higher than the noise in order for you to t to detect it. That's the way to interpret this diagram. So we can see what I was talking about before. LIGO has a lower uh, noise, the lowest peak noise, which means it has a better peak sensitivity, um, but it blows up um, above around 40 hertz, whereas Virgo was much more sensitive down to, down to around 10 hertz. Um, and the advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo retrofits, um, uh, you can see that they are an order of magnitude more sensitive. Uh, so they should be able to detect much more uh, um, uh, real physics events. Uh, so what we, what's usually quoted for LIGO and Virgo is that their sensitivity is to an amplitude of about 10 to the minus 21, uh, whereas um, the advanced ones, minus 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23. Um, and again, remember, that's just change in length over length. So it's a unitless measurement of the strain uh, from a gravitational wave. Um, and then possible future uh, detectors, we're looking to build these guys, build a hopefully build an interferometer in space. Uh, that project is called LISA, which has been in sort of a dance trying to get uh, funding from NASA or the European Space Agency. Um, but it would have a, an arm length of about 10 million, uh, 10 million, uh, yeah, 10 million meters. And, uh, and it would be sensitive to much lower, uh, much lower frequencies. Um, it would possibly be able to detect uh, sor sort of uh, stochastic backgrounds from supermassive black hole mergers and things like that. Um, so maybe someday, and here's a little diagram, which is obviously not to scale. Um, and uh, another potential uh, way of uh, directly detecting gravitational waves are these so-called uh, pulsar timing arrays. Basically, uh, you can think of pulsars as natural clocks. They, they, uh, they repeat, they, their maxima repeat at a, a very stable frequency um, They ha with a, a certain sort of spin down, uh, which, which you can calculate. Um, and then by looking at many of these uh, timing signals that are very far away, you can look for um, uh, residuals in, in those timing signals to look for extremely low uh, frequency gravitational waves that are affecting, affecting the space uh, between Earth and those pulsars. Um, so yeah, frequencies on the order, order of uh, 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 nanohertz. Um, and again, looking to just detect the stochastic background um, with those guys. Um, okay, so yeah, so moving on to indirect detection of gravitational waves. Uh, 
which doesn't sound as exciting, but in reality is where we've been more successful um, in actually proving that, the, that there's a reason to believe that these things exist. Um, so the first real confirmation that gravitational waves are a thing uh, came from uh, Holson Taylor's observation of a binary pulsar. Um, they discovered this pulsar and monitored it over many years, and the, um, the, uh, the decrease in the orbital period uh, showed an extremely good match with the predictions from general rel relativity. Uh, so here's a plot from a, uh, a paper in 2005, which includes, includes some of that data for that pulsar. Um, and that was our, and uh, you know, so this, this is the work that, that they got their Nobel Prize for in 1993, I believe. Um, which basically, uh, very, very strong evidence that uh, rotating um, or co-rotating bodies at least lose energy uh, due to gravitational processes. Um, and then, you know, if anybody's looking in 300 million years, this pulsar might, uh, these, these rotating pulsars might merge and we'll be able to get a signal that would be detectable uh, with our current generation of um, interferometers. But hopefully we've made some progress by then. Um, anyway, and then another indirect uh, detection technique is for looking at uh, the different polarization modes of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so this is the, the BICEP2 result that's been in the news recently. Um, effectively, uh, basically uh, B-mode polarization is like the uh, curl of the polarization. You can sort of um, de uh, deconvolve the polarization field into components that are due to um, uh, the gradient of a scalar field and then these curl components. And those curl components are the B-mode. And they measured, um, it's actually easier to see if we go up to the blown up one here. Um, but this is their measurement uh, for the B-modes. Um, and so these lines, you can see how they sort of curl. Um, and this curling mode they measured in, in with more than the five sigma excess of what their background expectation was. So that was their uh, discovery that they have a direct, indirect detection of, of uh, uh, gravitational waves, um, you know, through this cosmic microwave background, um, and such uh, large amplitude uh, primordial gravitational waves are often are associated with uh, inflationary theories about of, about the early universe. So this is also seen as sort of um, evidence for inflationary theories as well. Um, okay, so. Now a little bit more about how these things are actually generated. Uh, so in the wild, gravitational waves that we expect to see with our interferometers uh, are, are going to be produced by uh, similar um, uh, objects to these, uh, uh, to what Holson Taylor discovered, these co-rotating uh, neutron stars or black holes. Um, so basically, uh, so I'll try to go, I won't dwell too much, um, but you can see, you can derive expressions in the um, in the mode where they're uh, not so close that they're actually merging and you need to do adva advanced computational calculations, but in the sort of uh, quasi-static uh, approximation, you can, you can derive a frequency and an amplitude as a function of time. Um, and these both uh, blow up as you get closer to the time that they merge, um, which gives a characteristic chirping signal. Basically, the frequency and the amplitude both go up as as these uh, orbiting bodies merge. Um, and that's the signal that we, we hope to maybe be able to detect uh, with these uh, interferometers. Um, and to just give an idea about you know, whether or not we actually expect to see these things, um, this, this table here shows uh, the expected uh, merger rates. Uh, NS is neutron star and BH is black hole. So this is for neutron star, neutron star, black hole, black hole. Uh, um, how many? Uh, we, of these we expect in a uh, MWEG is a Milky Way equivalent galaxy per million years. So you can see that these things are not very common uh, and the likelihood of seeing one in our galaxy is very low. Um, but, uh, but when you um, look at you know, a collection of more distant galaxies and account for the, um, the detecting sensitivities of the LIGO and uh, Virgo interferometers, you can see that we didn't really expect, you know, except on an off chance to observe them uh, uh, with the initial runs of these experiments. But there is, there is maybe some hope, at least in the uh, moderate 
uh, regime uh, that we might be able to see them with the advanced um, retrofits. Do you have a graph of this chart? Oh, an actual waveform? No, I, I don't yeah, have one of those. Uh, interesting form. Uh, let's see. So the frequency, so you can see the frequency dependence goes like uh, uh, tau to the minus three eighths, and the amplitude dependence goes like uh, tau to the minus one fourth. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so yeah, basically, it's just as a as a cartoon, I guess. I'd have to check check the details, but you expect lower frequency. Right, frequency. All right, yeah, that's not very good. <laughs> but um, but basically something like that, and then and then, and then you, power. well, yeah, then then you get into a region a, a regime where um, tidal forces are very important. You can no longer treat these things as point masses, and you have to do more complicated um, numerical studies. That's the the actual merger phase. Which has been so, done. Which has oh yes, been done. So yes. I don't I don't have those I don't have any of those results here. I didn't look. Uh, in depth into that, um, um, but this is this is just to give sort of an idea. Yeah, no, the point that, that there is a real characteristic signal, so that's what they will be looking for. They will be oh yes, yes. For for these, yeah. The the um, I, I glossed over here, but yeah, those numerical simulations have been done. There is a uh, uh, we do we do have a good idea what the characteristic waveform should look like. Um, I don't I don't have the knowledge right now to <laughs> to draw it accurately. Um, um, but by knowing what, what we expect to see, it, it, it helps uh, with our sensitivities as well. Yeah. Chris, where is the cutoff at, like, when they merge? Yeah, it's, it's the distance become, when the distance becomes comparable to the size of the objects. Um, so this approximation, um, it, it, you can probably push it down, like for rotating neutron stars, probably push it down to like 20 kilometers or something like that. Um, and, and then at that point, you need to do uh, the more detailed calculation. Um, uh, another type of uh, um, another thing that we might, might uh, another excuse me <laughs> um, another way to produce uh, gravitational waves um, astronomically is is through um, so-called burst events. These are going to be brief uh, moments of high amplitude gravitational wave generation uh, that we don't have as good of a model uh, for um, an actual waveform, um, unlike the uh, unlike the co-rotating. Uh, neutron stars and black holes. Uh, so one, one possible, one candidate would be uh, non-uniform uh, uh, supernova collapse. Again, remember, um, there's no such thing as monopole radiation, so a symmetrical supernova isn't going to give you anything as far as gravitational waves. Um, although there is some evidence that we, we should expect there to be an asymmetry in, in uh, supernova collapses, um, um, fr just from the fact that um, neutron stars, which we believe to be generated uh, by supernova events tend to have very high relative velocities compared to their nearby stars, um, which you know suggests that there's an asymmetry there. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, this is this is another one of those sort of uh, uh, back of the napkin uh, expressions for uh, how we uh, what the amplitudes we expect from uh, from a supernova collapse is basically relating to the amount of energy that's released, um, and uh, and by putting some marginal uh, values uh, in there, we would expect that if there was a supernova in our in our galaxy, we would probably be able to detect it with the uh, with the initial runs of LIGO or Virgo. Um, and then uh, some scenarios for supernova collapse, um, like uh, bar mode instabilities, where basically um, a highly rotating star is perturbed in such a way that it collapses into a quickly rotating quadrupole. Uh, which is exactly what you want to generate a lot of uh, um, gravitational radiation. Um, those modes of collapse could potentially be observable from from other galaxies. Um, and then another way that another potential way to get uh, bursts of gravitational waves is these um, by uh, uh, f um, flares of these so-called magnetars, which are essentially. Uh, um, uh, Neutron stars that have anomalously high magnetic fields, um, um, which are thought to be um, the physical objects behind uh, soft gamma ray repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars. Um, these have been known to occasionally give off extremely uh, luminous flares of radiation, um, and some 
uh, some models uh, propose that uh, basi they basically radiate by re reorganizing their extremely strong magnetic fields. And some models suggest that the, they may release comparable amounts of energy as, in the form of gravitational uh, radiation, um, in which case there's maybe some hope that these could be uh, observed as well. Um, uh, and on top of that, there are also uh, uh, some continuous sources uh, in the context of uh, interferometers, continuous sources basically refers to uh, just quickly rotating neutron stars that have some uh, non-axially symmetric, symmetric distribution. Um, so again, I, I won't dwell on the equation here because I think I might be running, on, running out of time. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but basically, uh, um, but yeah, ba basically that's the equation that gives you the, the amplitude for a rotating uh, a rotating neutron star, um, and then uh, and then on top of that, there are also uh, some stochastic sources uh, we don't expect, to, which basically a, a background of gravitational waves from things like cosmic string cusps um, or coalescing supermassive black holes, which would be uh, in the regime of ultra low uh, frequency, which we could perhaps detect with uh, space-based interferometers. Um, and then the primordial gravitational waves from the early expansion of the universe, which is what uh, BICEP2 believes that it, it found. Um, and, then just, uh, and then just generally the summation of all the binary coalescences from faraway galaxies, adding up to basically a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Um, all right, so that's basically it. Um, just a, a couple conclusion, concluding remarks um, that in gravitational wave astronomy there is uh, I just wanted to mention that there is some hope of getting some new physics. Um, a detailed look at the waveforms from an actual uh, neutron star coalescence could give us some inform information about the equation of state um, for neutron stars, um, also, and also just provide um, a deep confirmation of, of general relativity, um, and also uh, just as sort of a way into supernovas, uh, since gravitational waves aren't modified as much as light. Uh, from propagating through dust and other matter. Um, and then uh, uh, we may, uh, if we look, looking at that plot of the expected rates of observations of neutron star coalescences, uh, there is some hope that with the next generation of ground-based interferometers, we could begin to see some actual physics signals. Um, and then to just highlight, even though we've only uh, achieved indirect measurements of gravitational waves, uh, they can tell us a lot. Um, or about, about our universe and at least confirm what we know from general relativity. Um, so then I have a list of references. I just want to point out, um, I mostly followed this, uh, this review by, uh, by Riles. Um, it's a good, it's, it's worth reading if you want to get a little more background here. Um, and that, that pointed me to most of my other references uh, as well. So I'd recommend that. And then, uh, and then yeah, so I'm all done. So if there are any questions. You know, feel free. Yeah. Um, I totally don't understand for the um, bicep result. Like the, right. the different, the two kinds of polarizations. I understand like the transverse and and the one that's in the direction of propagation. But when you're talking about the ones that are like the um, the curl versus the divergence, do you have any idea what kind of objects? Um, yes, yeah, sort of. I, it's going to be, I, I, again, um, highlighting that I'm not an expert in the field. Um, but, uh, but yeah, E-mode polarization is what we expect to be the dominant form. You, you expect polarizations to be along the lines of uh, temperature gradients in the cosmic microwave background, essentially. Um, and other, and so B-mode is basically your other. That's um, effects from propagating through gas that, I that introduce um, a circular polarization that causes you to measure a curl in that, in that, in that polarization field, uh, and things like gravitational waves, which, which give you the, uh, the opportunity to sort of misalign those uh, polarization vectors with respect to those gradients. Uh, so, so basically, naturally, we expect uh, the radiation to be sort of this E mode, right, to be um, curl free. Um, but then there's other, other parameters that sort of give it a curl, right? Uh, any others? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
OK, hi. Um, I'm Nick. Uh, my presentation is on frame dragging, and um, in particular, um, the dragging of satellites around the Earth. Um, so a quick outline of my talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start by talking about this parameterized post-Newtonian formalism. Um, and the reason for that is because um, in the solar system, generally, we're dealing with a low velocity, um, low mass limit. And so you don't need to deal with the equations, um, with Einstein's equations in uh, their exact form. You can use these expansions, and um, it works out pretty well. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the precession of gyroscopes using, or using this formalism. Um, in particular, there's um, two effects called the geodetic effect and then the frame dragging effect. Um, and then I'll focus particularly on one experiment, which is called Gravity Probe B. <coughs> I'll go over the experimental setups and the challenges they face and the result, results that they came up with. And then finally, I'll just mention a few other experiments that I've tried to uh, measure the uh, frame dragging. So the whole idea behind um, PPN is that um, the full solutions are unnecessary and usually difficult to um, solve. Uh, and they're completely unnecessary within the solar system. Um, so what we do is we expand things in terms of um, small parameters, namely v squared and um, the potential gm over r. Um, and then we can construct. So the nice thing about this is we can construct um, a single post-Newtonian theory that generalizes, that's very general. Um, it, it can uh, approximate any potential um, metric theory of gravity that you have um, by sticking in, all the, sticking in an arbitrary set of parameters. Um, so one example of these parameters is just this one. So there's 10 parameters. Um, uh, and this is. So this, so for instance, um, in order to get Einstein gravity out of this one, you just set all of these parameters equal to one, except for um, these two. Um, and most of them have some kind of physical intuition that you can associate with them. Um, so once you've uh, set up your parameters, you can uh, write out the various quantities, like the metric for velocity, stress, energy, tensor, um, in terms of them and then go about solving whatever equations you need to whatever um, order you need the accuracy for. All right, so um, precession of a gyroscope. Um, so as long as we can neglect tidal forces, um, the spin of a gyroscope will uh, obey what's called Fermi-Walker transport, which is just a generalization of parallel transport. Um, and so that equation is given here. So additionally, um, the easiest way to deal with this equation is to work in um, a coordinate frame that moves uh, along with the gyroscope. And so I've just sort of uh, written that out here just to be explicit. Um, So you, coming from this, um, you do some manipulations. And what you end up with is this term is actually equal to uh, the precession with respect to the um, co-moving frame. And uh, then you evaluate this term. You do some work to do that. And eventually, what you end, what should end up getting is, in terms of three-dimensional vector notation, um, you get this expression where the angular velocity of the um, spin axis processes um, at this rate. Um, so there's a bunch of terms here. Um, and I'll talk about those in the next slide. Um, but basically, this equation describes, again, in complete generality, um, the precession of a gyroscope spin relative to a co-moving frame that is um, rotationally tied to the PPN frame, which is fixed relative to um, your, all your background stars and galaxies. Um, so um, again, I just wrote the same expression for the angular velocity here. 
Um, so there's three terms that appear. This first term is the Thomas precession, um, which we can neglect for um, a body falling freely. Um, this last term is um, caused by the curvature of space-time. And so as you travel through a curved space-time, you'll pick up some um, rotation. And uh, so if we pretend that the Earth isn't moving, we can ignore both of these terms, and we, get just, and we get, just get this part of the angular velocity. And so if we want to get a rough order of magnitude estimation for the uh, effect of this um, term, we can put in some numbers, right? So the sky is the grad u, and the sky is the velocity. Um, so for a gyroscope in polar orbit around the Earth, you end up with a number that's roughly eight seconds of arc per year. Um, which is small, but not hopelessly small. Um, so we do have some chance of measuring this. The precession, again, this is, so this is what's called the, the geodetic, geodetic effect. Um, and that is not frame dragging, right? So um, that's something, some, something different. So the gamma is the gamma that for Einstein's theory is one. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this gamma, again, yeah. That's, so you'll see these various parameters appear that those are just um, the PPN parameters. And so most of the time, they're just one. I think all of the ones that appear are one. So you can just um, kind of ignore them. This, I was following, actually, just to give you a reference, I, I, I followed Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler um, for this. Um, so now, if the Earth is rotating, and I've been assured that it is, um, then you get uh, the off-diagonal terms in the metric. Right, so. Ooh, yeah, so this term in the angular velocity equation, <coughs> if you work out what those are, you end up getting this expression, where these deltas, again, are just PPN parameters, and they're equal to 1. And so this whole thing right here is just equal to 1. Um, so qualitatively, if we study this, what we see is that um, near the north and south poles, the, an object will, act, will rotate um, in the same direction as the Earth. But if you're closer to the equator, you actually rotate in the opposite direction. Um, and sort of an analogy to understand this is if you imagine putting like a, a spherical ball or something inside of a tank of water or something and it starts rotating. Um, if you put something near the, near the uh, pole, it will obviously rotate in the same direction. Um, but if you put it near the equator, what happens is the water closer to the ball is moving faster than water away from it. And so it actually turns the objects the opposite direction. Um, so sort of qualitatively, that's what's happening here. Um, so again, we want to try and get a rough estimate for the magnitude of this effect. Um, so you put in some rough values, and you end up getting 0.1 arc seconds per year, which is about two orders of magnitude smaller than um, the geodetic effect. But um, still, both of these effects, uh, oh, this is called uh, the effect due to frame, frame dragging is, is called the lensatering effect. Um, and we realized, some people back in 1960 realized that both of these things should be observable and that we can construct an experiment to try and test general relativity. Right. So that experiment um, would become what's called gravity probe B. Um, so again, it was supposed to measure the geodetic effect and the lensatering effect um, to, for the geodetic effect, one part in 10,000, and the lensatering effect to 1%. Um, the conceptual design for it was actually first proposed back in 1959. Um, and then uh, more work was done and started in 1960 at Stanford. Um, and that's what would go on to become the uh, Gravity Probe B collaboration. Um, so just keep that date in mind when I talk about when it actually finished running. Um, so the gyroscopes are, were actually listed in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the most perfectly spherical objects ever created. Um, and the reason they needed to be so spherical was because they just wanted to minimize any potential Newtonian torques that would overwhelm the relativistic effects. Um, so they're about the size of ping pong balls, and they differed by no more than 40 atomic layers, which is less than 10 nanometers. So to give you kind of a sense of um, how spherical these things were. If you blew these up to the size of the Earth, uh, 
the, um, large, the tallest mountain or the lowest valley would be about eight feet. Uh, so again, another kind of annoying thing was, so the, because the orbit had to be very precise, it had to be exactly um, over the poles, their launch window was only one minute, and so the first launch had to get scrapped because there were some changing winds in the atmosphere. Um, and we got all of this for the low, low cost of $760 million. All right, so the experimental setup for Gravity Probe B, you can kind of see, see a, a cartoon of it here. Um, this is the satellite, so it rotates um, over the poles. And the reason they do this is to separate the two um, precession effects, the one due to the, the geodetic effect and the lensiteering effect. So if you have it rotate over the poles, um, the rotation of the Earth will pull it in one direction, and then the rotation or the orbit will pull it in the other direction. And so you have the two effects perpendicular to each other. Um, so these numbers here, the 6.6 .6 arc seconds per year and the 39 milli arc seconds per year, um, are the predictions um, from general relativity. And the other thing is that you have to fix your, um, so the spin will precess relative to the fixed coordinate system or the, 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 the fixed stars. And so you um, align your spacecraft with some star and you use a guiding telescope to do that. Um, so the, um, in the spacecraft, they had four London Moment gyroscopes. Um, so what the London Moment, the London Moment gyroscope is just a gyroscope that has, um, uh, they coat it with niobium and then they supercool it, so it's a superconductor. And what happens is if you have a spinning superconductor, you get a magnetic field, which is aligned with the uh, rotational axis. And so that's how they, and then they can measure the direction of the magnetic field using squids. Um, so that's how they measure the spin. Um, yeah, these are just some other facts. It was, it was the gyroscopes had to be stored in vacuum flasks, super cooled to 1.8 Kelvin, um, and they had to minimize any torques or interactions, so they had to suspend it with electric fields. Um, so they faced a lot of challenges. So here's just a picture of um, the gyroscopes. So this one is the, they're made out of fused quartz. So this is this one, and then this, they uh, coated them with niobium, which is just the metal. Um, so that's shown there. Um, so again, they had to be really spherical. Um, the squid calibration, um, calibration is always kind of a mess. Um, so measuring the proper motion of the guide star was uh, a challenge. And they also had to deal with uh, helium evaporating and escaping from the vacuum tubes, or the vacuum containers. Um, but they actually came up with a clever way to use this to their advantage. Um, so they had to deal also with atmospheric drag. Right? So you want your spacecraft to be in perfect freefall. Um, but even at 642 kilometers in altitude, there's still some atmospheric drag. And so what they did was they had eight microthrusters on the spacecraft, which would blow little puffs of um, escaped helium gas out. Um, and these puffs were supposedly orders of magnitude less um, forceful than a human breath. Um, so that's the kind of precision that they had to um, do, or correct. That's the kind of corrections that they had to make in order to uh, do this measurement. Um, so one, the biggest problem that they encountered, um, which they sort of anticipated, but they didn't correctly um, anticipate how much it would affect things, um, were that because the <coughs> gyroscopes were not perfectly spherical, they got um, patches of charge, um, which caused the spin axes to not be perfectly aligned with the moment of inertia <laughs> axis. Um, and that misalignment caused there to be unwanted torques. And another thing was that, um, this was I think completely unexpected, was that um, every so often they noticed that the spin would migrate by tens of arc seconds um, over the course of a day. Um, and the reason for this was because there was some resonance going on between um, the precession of the gyroscope's axis and the spacecraft, which was rotating in order to cancel out some um, torques. And so when this 
when this rate of precession was um, like an integer multiple of the spacecraft's roll period, then you got this resonance and it would cause the spin axes to precess more or much faster. Um, and that was not an anticipated effect. Um, and the a real problem was that they'd only realized these things after they'd put the spacecraft up and taken all the data. And um, so this thing was launched in 2004. And initially, they had expected to have um, their analysis complete within a year after that. But it actually took them more than five years in order to understand the effect of the charge patches. Um, so they created, once they had created a model um, and applied it, um, the uncertainties were much larger than they had anticipated. Um, so earlier I said that they had wanted to measure this effect, the geodetic effect, to one part in 10,000, and the frame dragging effect to 1%. And you can see what they actually ended up getting was about 0.3% and 19%. Um, but all that considered, um, they still were, got results that were completely consistent with um, theoretical predictions. So here I show you the theoretical prediction, and then here are the experimental results with the error bars. Um, and then in this plot, we just plot the, um, so this axis is uh, the lens adhering effect, and this axis is basically the geodetic effect. Um, and gyro 2 was particularly um, poorly behaved, which is why it has sort of a, the largest error there. Um, but you can see right in the middle, there's the, uh, um, the theoretical prediction, and then the joint, the, the joint result from all of these different gyros is right around that. Um, gyro 2 just barely makes it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so um, just a few other experiments, which I didn't look into quite as in depth. Um, so there's these Lagios two, 1 and 2 satellites. Um, and basically, they're, um, they, they're reflective satellites that are rotating around the Earth. And we track their position very accurately by shooting lasers at them. And then the lasers reflect back, and we um, can track them that way. Um, and so in principle, the lens adhering effect should drag the orbital planes of these satellites. And because we know they're um, their position so precisely, um, we can actually measure um, the, the lens adhering effect that way. The problem is we have to assume the correctness of the geodetic effect. Um, so another one is this Mars Global Surveyor, um, which was launched in 1996 and put in orbit around Mars in 1997. And some people have tried to use data from that in order to uh, constrain this effect. Um, there's been some controversy over how they did that. Um, and then the latest one is this Larry's um, one, which is very similar, I think, to these satellites. Um, it was launched in 2012. It's supposedly the densest known object orbiting the solar system. Um, and their goal is to measure the lens adhering effect to an accuracy of 1%. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, so there's some debate as to all of these um, the procedure and how accurate they can do it. Um, but supposedly, um, so the, the, the kind of terrible thing is that um, <clears throat> this, um, if this is correct, they'd done this even before um, Gravity Probe B launched. And so they ended up doing better, even though, and so they spent all this money trying to measure this thing, and then it wasn't even the best um, measurement to date. Um, but. Yeah, I think it was interesting. So that's all I have. Um, are there any questions? What is this business of the densest known object in the solar system? Um, yeah, that's just sort of, I just read that on their like uh, experiment page. I guess they like to brag about, like, like how um, Gravity Pro B what like to brag about there. Uh, I didn't, I don't remember. But, yeah. Is it big? Is it small? I mean, is that, um, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions?